Yesterday was finally the big day. We harvested our three young roosters, and this was only our second time harvesting our own chickens. And we had some different thoughts and input that I'll kind of like talk about here. I am not going to show the whole process of us doing it though because there's so many other great videos out there. In fact, I'll put a link in the description to my favorite video, but YouTube doesn't like it anyway. So <laughs> I'll just show our setup and talk a little bit about our thoughts after going through it a second time. For us, harvesting our own meat is goes into the whole thing of we don't want to expect somebody else to do these things for us if we can't do them for ourselves. Granted, there's going to be a lot of people that doing this is just too difficult. And that's where community comes into play. It is important to consider though, if you are thinking about hatching your own chickens, that you're going to have to have a plan to deal with excess roosters. Are you gonna set up an entire rooster bachelor pad and just feed them and let them live out your, their life on your homestead? That's absolutely fine if that's what you want to do. Or are you going to try to give them away, which can be really difficult, or are you going to dispatch excess roosters? So unless you're going to buy sexed chicks all the time, you have to have a plan for your roosters. To start off the whole process, the first thing that I like to do is obviously have the birds separated from the rest of the flock the night before and take away their food. They always have free access to water, but the reason I take away their food is so that they have less stuff in their crop that I have to worry about spillage. The first thing we do harvest morning is get all our equipment set up with all our stations to make sure everything is good to go to make the whole process as the least amount of stress as possible because it's already a stressful day and the number one advice that I would tell somebody the first time going into this is if you're going to use like uh, a knife or you're going to use shears or even an axe make sure your equipment is sharp like really really sharp the last thing you want to do is go into a scenario and then realize your equipment is failing you and that will probably create a very traumatizing experience for you and your animal. Like, you don't want that. The equipment we set up consists of our killing cone, our scalding area where we're going to scald the bird, and then our plucker where we're going to pluck all the feathers off the bird. You can hand pluck your bird if you want, which is probably just fun if you're doing like one or two, but it really is nice if you can have a plucker. and. In some places, you can rent this equipment. Before we even start the process, I begin to get my scalding water up to about 150 degrees. You don't wanna get it too much warmer than that because you don't want to actually start cooking the bird. You just want to get the feathers loosened up so that the feathers are easy to pluck off. And then we get one of the birds and Glenn likes to hold it upside down until he says the bird chills out and relaxes. And then we place the bird into the cone and then Glenn dispatches it from there and if you have a very feathery bird and you're going to be doing the, um, the throat method I'm trying to use my words so carefully because YouTube is so weird talking about this stuff just be careful if you're doing the throat method with a knife with a very feathery bird that you separate all the feathers away because if you find yourself trying to cut into feathers it's not gonna go very smoothly once the bird has been bled out and the scalding tank is up to 150 degrees, we dunk the bird into the scalding tank trying to cover all the feathers until I can easily remove some of the wing feathers by hand. At that point, the bird is removed from the scalding tank and placed inside the plucker where we have a water hose that we spray around. That way the feathers can easily be moved out of the plucker as it's doing its job. And then at that point, it's time to dress the chicken. We did not let Kaja outside while we were doing our harvesting because it kind of seemed weird that she's supposed to like be caring for and protecting the chickens. And then here we are doing what we we're doing and that might be like kind of weird in her head. So she just had to stay inside all day. And I know somebody out there is wondering what happened to Whitey. He's right there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
it's never an easy day and we always thank our creator for these gifts that he gives us and have respect for the animal and treat it really well while it's here with us and it has one bad day and the rest were really good. My sap is boiling down real nicely. I should be able to turn that into syrup tonight, which we have so much volume coming in each day right now that it's really great to just kind of stay on top of that. That way I don't get overwhelmed. And the other thing that I want to do this evening is take care of the birds that I have resting in the fridge. Usually after harvesting a bird, you want to let it rest in the fridge for one to two days. It just kind of helps to like loosen up the meat. But these were older roos, almost, what, almost a year old so the meat's gonna be kind of tough anyway and to deal with that my plan is this evening to turn it into canned chicken One of the most common questions people ask when they see me collecting maple sap is, you know, how much syrup do I get out of that? And as I've said before, the ratio of sap to syrup is 40 to one. So for every 40 gallons of sap that you collect, you'll get about one gallon of syrup. And this really puts it into perspective because today I collected five gallons of sap and I got one pint. It's 40 to 1. So you can see what an energy intensive process this really is.